Okay, we've still got some people coming in, but we've got just about almost 40 people here. So um, just wanted to welcome everyone to the Introduction to Matrimonial Real Property and Case Study Workshop, um, going to be hosted by Kathy McHugh. She is our MRP specialist at NALMA. Um, before that, I just wanted to go over a few housekeeping items. If everyone could ask everyone to please keep their mics on mute at all times. Um, we will be taking questions in the chat feature, which is located at the bottom of your screen. If you just wanted to type your question in there, I will make note of them and they can be asked to Kathy. Um, I will ask them at the end of her session. Um, or if you would like to ask yourself, I will unmute your microphone at the end of the session. Um, I just wanted to remind you that session feedback forms are located in the Whova app under the survey section. So please, uh, we encourage you to fill out um, your feedback form on each of the sessions that you attend over the course of two days. And also a reminder that this session is being recorded. That recording can also be found on the Whova app, as well as any of the PowerPoint slides that are be being given um, in all of these workshops. Um, and so with that, I, you can take it away, Kathy. <laughs> thanks, Jess. Um, hi, everyone. First of all, thanks to the organizers for this invitation to provide the introduction to matrimonial real property and case study. Um, I hope all of you and your communities are safe and well in these crazy times. Um, for those of you who are back for a refresher, welcome back. I see some, uh, I see some names on the list. Um, happy that you're popping back in. And to those of you who are attending the session for the first time, um, we're glad you could join us. Um, Char, in terms of questions, if as you're um, watching the chat, if you see something that you think is absolutely necessary to ask at that point in time, feel free to interrupt. I'm, I'm open to that. Okay, sure. Great. What are we doing here? We, we we will take a break as well, right, Kathy? Uh, that's um, correct. At 5.45? Yes, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> 5.45 our time. Right. Uh, 2.45 for everyone else, probably. Already. <laughs> Good. Okay, so first of all, just uh, as a bit of an introduction, um, we're, the, we're with the National Aboriginal Land Managers, Managers Association, and we're a national organization of land managers. Um, generally a lot of active networking, professional development, um, really intending uh, our mission really is to enhance land management capacities on, uh, on First Nation reserves. This is NALMA. Our membership makes up eight, is made up, pardon me, of eight regional land associations. So we have BCOM, uh, Tulsa, SALT, Manitoba, Aski, uh, OLA in Ontario. We've got FN, LMA, QL in Quebec. Uh, plan in Nunavut, and we have Arla in the Atlantic region. So those are our eight. Uh, we also have, uh, NAMA consists of several specialized units that offer training, um, resources, technical support, funding uh, to some of our members, and other professionals in the field of land management. So we have the professional development unit, we have the survey unit, we have a land use planning unit, and we also have the environment unit. Um, one of our, our most important functions is the Professional Land Management Certification Program, or PLMCP as it's known. Um, it's designed in partnership specifically for uh, our land First Nations, Reserve Land Environment Management Program, uh, First Nations operating uh, under that regime. But there's also some benefit, uh, training benefits to First Nations who are also operating under the framework agreement for First Nation lands management. Level two consists of post-secondary training with some of our partner institutions. And then the level two training uh, is more hands-on technical training that NALMA hosts in the second year. And after you've completed both of those, um, the requirements for both of those sessions, then there is a NALMA certification. We currently have 196 certified land managers. 
The Center of Excellence for Matrimonial Real Property uh, began operations in December of 2013. Our mandate initially was for five years. Uh, at the end of that five years, there was a, an identification for additional support. So we've had a number of extensions, um, but at March 31st of this year, 2021, we rolled up the operations of the Center of Excellence. NALMA though is going to continue to offer support through training, lawmaking, we have some funding available, uh, a number of resources and referrals. That's going to be normalized into the NALMA operations until March 31st of 2023. Now, coemrp.ca uh, continues to be where you can find the majority of our resources. Uh, that will be migrating over to nalma.ca in the next little bit. So um, in the short go, you can find us at the old website, uh, but eventually when it migrates over, there'll be a link as well. So I am the uh, MRP program specialist here at NALMA, and we also have support from Catherine Fagan. She um, provides Francophone support. So our colleagues in, uh, in some of our uh, uh, French speaking communities uh, can contact Catherine for any support that you might need with respect to matrimonial work property. We've also got some funding opportunities that I'd just like to mention very quickly. Uh, we have special project funding for things like land use planning development, matrimonial real property lawmaking initiatives, whether that's um, drafting a law, ratifying a law, implementing a law, implementing the provisional federal rules if you're not ready to move into uh, drafting your own law. And we also have a little bit of funding as well for surveys. You could visit the NAMA website NALMA.ca uh, for a little bit more information on, on those sorts of uh, projects. So what are we going to talk about this afternoon? Well, in terms of the introduction to matrimonial real property, we are going to cover what matrimonial real property actually consists of. We'll take some time to figure out why it was deemed that legislation was even necessary to address this topic. We'll talk specifically about what's contained in the Family Homes on Reserves and Matrimonial Interests or Rights Act. Um, moving forward, you're going to hear me say FERMIRA. That's just the acronym for that, the name of that legislation. It's tremendously long, and we'd be here a really long afternoon if I had to say that name every time uh, I was referencing it. So FERMIRA. We'll also talk about the rights and the powers that are conferred by the Act including the powers of a First Nation to act its own law, as well as a set of provisional federal rules that apply in most First Nations until such time as you enact uh, your own matrimonial real property legislation. I'm going to speak very briefly about the framework agreement considerations, but I just really want to preface that by saying I'm not an expert on the framework agreement. Um, and if you are, in fact, a signatory, your best first step is always the uh, your LabRC technical person. So um, I can answer some questions specific to the to Fermira, but framework questions in the application um, of the legislation to to framework um, signatories is uh, I, I prefer that you have that conversation with the LabRC. They're much more um, able to answer your questions. I'll also talk about some of the provisions that are contained in the legislation that are intended to balance the collective rights of the First Nation with the individual rights of spouses and common law partners who are residing on, on the reserve. And then after we've gone through all of that, I'd like to take um, a little bit of time to actually do a case study. Um, it's the Tony versus Tony estate. Uh, it's the first real substantial judicial interpretation uh, around the application of Fermira. And I think there's some interesting things to, to learn um, by listening to that case study and really kind of seeing how uh, the provisions of the legislation were applied practically. And then as Shar has said, we'll have an opportunity for, for questions at the end, or maybe in the middle, if, uh, if something comes up that needs to be addressed immediately. This is just my legal disclaimer. The National Aboriginal Land Managers Association, we do not provide legal advice. 
This presentation is absolutely only for information. We understand what the legislation says and what it was intended to do. But because it is a new piece of legislation and there is very little case law interpreting it to this point, there may be some uh, changes in public policy or changes in interpretation that we can't preemptively um, speak to. So always important to recognize that you know we're giving you the information that we have today. Uh, some uh, judge in some court in Canada may have a different interpretation, which will in fact potentially change the way the legislation is implemented. We also always recommend that individuals who are looking for information on um, what they may or may not be entitled to, uh, to seek legal advice. We can certainly explain what rights and protections exist within the legislation, um, but your own legal counsel is always in a better position because they are going to have a good understanding of the Indian Act, the First Nation Land Code, if that's applicable, They'll have an understanding of FRAMIRA or your First Nation MRP law, but more importantly, they'll have a good understanding of the couple's specific circumstances. So we're always going to suggest that you, um, you consult with your own legal counsel. So what's matrimonial real property to start with? Well, matrimonial real property is the land and it's held by one or both spouses or common law partners, and it's used by the family. It could include houses, sheds, and any other structures securely attached to the land. Personal property is everything else. Personal property is the movable assets, the furniture, the cars, the fish hut, the cash, the sofa, all of those things are uh, personal property. And it's important to distinguish between the two, uh, important to appreciate what matrimonial real property is as opposed to personal property because of the jurisdictional considerations. So, Jurisdiction for matrimonial real property on reserves is federal, while personal property is within the jurisdiction of the province. So why is that? In, in, at the risk of getting too deep into a, a discussion of the Constitution Act, it's still important to understand just because it demonstrates the interplay between the federal and the provincial legislation. So under the Constitution Act of 1867, 9124 gave parliament power over Indians and lands reserved for Indians. Coincidentally, 9126 also um, identified parliament as having the power over marriage and divorce. The provincial legislatures, however, under 9213 were granted authority over po uh, property and civil rights in the province. And that includes matters relating to uh, family law. So the best way to demonstrate the interplay is by identifying um, this legislative gap. So back in 1986, the Supreme Court of Canada ruled in a case, Derrickson versus Derrickson, and they determined that the courts can apply provincial or territorial family laws to matrimonial real property on reserves, right? because the parliament has exclusive jurisdiction over lands reserved for Indians under 9124. And the Indian Act doesn't address the issue either. So as a result, many of the legal protections and rights regarding matrimonial real property that were available to individuals um, elsewhere were not available to individuals who were living on reserves. And that is, uh, what we um, identify as the legislative gap. So in terms of filling that gap, there were a number of initiatives. The federal government included in their self-government policy some guidelines to make sure that on-reserve MRP interests or rights were built into self-government agreements involving reserve land management. Uh, the First Nation Land Management Act, the um, signatory First Nations, uh, develop land codes to manage their reserve lands. And it, it provided at the time 12 months from the date that a nation's land code took effect to enact rules and procedures dealing with MRP and reserve lands into their land code or into a First Nation law. But even with those initiatives, um, the number of First Nations who actually developed measures to deal with matrimonial royal property was quite small. So there remained 
very few protections for spouses and common law partners uh, who were living on reserve, experiencing relationship breakdown uh, or the death of a spouse. So in on June the 19th of uh, 2013, the Family Homes on Reserves and Matrimonial Interests or Rights Act received royal assent. Um, and it was intended to ensure that those of us who live on reserves have similar protections. They can't be identical just because of the nature of reserve land, but we can have similar protections and rights as other Canadians when it comes to the family home and to the division of interests or rights. So the Family Homes on Reserves and Matrimonial Interests or Rights Act has two main um, parts. The first part covered in section seven through 11, they took effect December the 16th of 2013. And that is a mechanism by which a First Nation can enact its own matrimonial real property law. So what that mechanism entails is uh, a First Nation obviously engaging with its community and determining what its uh, principles are, the kinds of um, things that they want to include in their own matrimonial real property law. Um, engaging a legislative drafter to come up with and, and give words to those sentiments. And then the First Nation is obligated to submit that law to its members for approval through a vote. So a First Nation who is intending to enact its own law has to make sure and give good notice to its members as to how, when, and where they can exercise their right to vote on this law that's being proposed by the First Nation. So um, when the vote takes place, there are some parameters, there are some metrics that, um, that allow um, a, a law to be considered approved. So during the vote, at least 25% of your eligible voters have to participate in the vote. So if you have 1,000 as a, as a nice round number, if you have 1,000 eligible voters on your voters list, then at least 250 of them have to participate in the vote. So that's the first hurdle. The, the second piece is that then a majority of those who voted must vote in favor in order for the law to be considered. It's a two-stage process. So if you don't meet the threshold of the 25%, then um, really the, the number that voted in favor is inconsequential because you must meet the threshold and then the majority would be considered. Um, if a First Nation is enacting its matrimonial where property, it, law under its land code, however, then that First Nation would use the lawmaking provisions contained in the land code. Okay. The second piece of the act are these PFRs, provisional federal rules. Those took effect a year later. So December the 16th of 2014. Um, and the reason for the, the, the one year delay was really, I think that the, that the um, that the government recognized that there were some First Nations who were already in the process of enacting legislation to address this. So the, the one year delay gave a little bit of time to tidy those up and get those, um, those laws enacted prior to the provisional rules taking effect. So what these rules, rules do is they, they provide a set of rules for dealing with matrimonial real property until the First Nation passes its own MRP law or indefinitely, if a First Nation chooses not to, to enact. And what it also does is it, it helps spouses and common law partners to understand what they might be entitled to with respect to lands, the family home, or other structures that exist um, and that they might have an interest in when a marriage or a common law relationship ends. So the provisional federal rules cease to apply once a First Nation law is enacted. But as we move farther and farther away from December the 16th, 2014, it's just important to remember that there may in fact be situations where you have enacted your own matrimonial real property law, but the provisional federal rules continue to apply because they were in force at the time that this relationship broke down. 
So again, filling the legislative gap, if everything in that circle um, is something that needs to be addressed or dealt with on the uh, breakdown of a relationship or the death of a spouse, then everything in the blue portion is already within the jurisdiction of the province that you reside in. So the provincial family law regime will help you to settle issues related to child support, custody, who gets the money in the bank, who gets the car, the furniture, the boats, all of those movable assets. Remember that we talked about personal property. The tiny little sliver of red is really all that Fermira deals with. That's the land, family home, and any other structures that are located on the reserve. So effectively, if you are unable to resolve your matrimonial real property issues um, and you find yourself uh, in a court in your province dealing with both issues, then what's going to happen is the, um, the, the judge that's hearing your, your case is going to basically have the provincial family law regime in one hand to deal with all of those issues in blue. But when it comes to land and the family home and those other structures that exist on the reserve, then they are either going to have a copy of the provisional federal rules, if you don't have your own law in place yet, or they're going to have to have a copy of your matrimonial real property law in order to interpret um, and come to a, an answer around how the land and the family home is treated. So Fermira provides these PFRs, the provisional federal rules, or the First Nation enacts its own matrimonial real property law, either under Fermira or under its land code. So Fermira applies on most reserves now, but there are some exceptions. And until the First Nation enacts its own MRP law, as I said, either under Fermira or uh, under your land code. So who are those exceptions? This is a little bit of a complicated chart, but um, if you follow it through, if you've got any questions about whether this legislation applies in your First Nation or in the First Nation that you are employed by, it's just a matter of kind of working your way through. So the question is, um, the First Nation has brought into force its own matrimonial real property law in accordance with Vermeer or its land code. So if the answer to that is yes, we have enacted our own law and it is in force, then clearly the First Nations matrimony real property law applies as of the date of its coming into force. If, however, the answer is no, the First Nation has not brought into force its own matrimony real property law, then we've got three other questions uh, to, to consider. So is the First Nations reserve land managed in accordance with the Indian Act? If you can say yes, we, we continue to manage our lands under the Indian Act, then the provisional federal rules apply. Those are sections 12 to 52, and they came into force December 16th of 2014, you will recall. If you are not managing your lands under the Indian Act, but are instead a signatory to the framework agreement, then the next question is, was our land code in force before December the 16th of 2014? If you had a land code in force before that date, then the provisional federal rules do not apply, okay? If you did not have a land code in place on that date, but you were a signatory, so you were on the schedule of the First Nation Lands Management Act, before June the 19th of 2013. So if you were on the schedule on that date of royal assent, then those First Nations received a three-year extension before the provisional federal rules began to apply, okay? So if you were on the schedule on that date, that, or prior to that date, then the provisional federal rules apply as of June the 19th, 2016. And again, until your First Nation brings into force its own matrimonial real property law. If you were not yet on the schedule on the date of royal assent, June the 19th, 2013, then the provisional federal rules apply as of December 16th, 2014. 
right? So uh, a little bit, um, a little bit complicated. I just want to point out the little green uh, circular note in the left hand corner. Uh, if your law was brought into force after the date that the PFRs came into force, we talked about this a little bit earlier, um, then the provisional federal rules apply until the date that the matrimonial real property law came into force. And then your rules would apply after that point to relationship breakdown during the time that your law was in force. Um, again, just to, uh, to reiterate that note that the provisional federal rules do not apply and have never applied to First, no First Nations that had a land code in force prior to December the 16th of 2014, which was the initial coming into force of the PFRs. Self-governing First Nations, if you're a self-governing First Nation, then really you would refer to the self-government agreement for your next steps. There is a mechanism uh, for the minister um, on the agreement if, if a self-governing First Nation uh, retained reserve lands and wished the provisional rules to apply, they could ask the minister um, to, to make a declaration to that effect. Okay, so a little bit complicated, but I think if you follow it through, uh, it will answer your questions. And at the end of this presentation is my contact information. You're always welcome to, uh, to give me a call or email me. Um, we can walk through the situation. But again, if you're a signatory, always your best step is to contact your LabRC regional advisor. So what does the Family Homes on Reserves and Matrimonial Interests or Rights Act actually do? Well, it provides rights to spouses and common law partners during a relationship and after it ends. And it could end because there was a divorce or a common law couple has separated or one of the spouses has actually died. And it, it really addresses two specific issues, use, possession, and occupation of family homes on reserve and secondly is a division of the value of any interest that they might hold in structures and land on reserve. So in order to really understand um, what this legislation does, it's important to know some of the really critical definitions. I'm gonna highlight just a few of them. Um, the family home is the first example. So the family home is where you reside as a couple. So it's the structure. It doesn't need to be affixed, but it has to be situated on reserve land where the spouses or common law partners habitually reside or where they lived on the day on which they stopped living together or the death occurred. Okay, so that's the family home where you, where you habitually resided as a couple. That's your family home. Matrimonial interests or rights, on the other hand, is those are interests or rights other than interests or rights in or to the family home. There's a, a, a fairly complete definition of the act. Um, might be a good idea to take a peek at that as well. But this is just my little demonstration of what, um, what the difference is. So the family home that's the structure where the couple habitually resided on the day of separation or death okay so that's that little house there on lot 30. everything else is a matrimonial interest or right and that includes the land underneath that family home this vacant lot that you may be uh, purchased during the course of your marriage or that you may have purchased prior to your marriage but has increased in value um, and it might include also this uh, little property here on lot 28 that, um, I don't know, let's say we inherited that from grandma. So grandma left us that lot and that uh, the home that's situated on that lot. So it's really just bouncing back there, sorry. Um, it's really important to, to note that um, the difference between those issues specifically because we how those are treated in terms of division are very very different so we'll get to that uh, in a few slides so fermeria applies to married couples and common law partners living on reserve where at least one of them is a first nation member or an indian as defined by the indian act okay so common married couples or common law partners living on reserve 
where at least one of them is a First Nation member or an Indian. So if you happen to be a First Nation that has designated land as an example, and you have um, um, residential leases, maybe we'll say you have residential leases on designated land, Fermira would not necessarily apply to the individuals living in those leased, on that leased land in their homes, unless at least one of them was a member or, uh, or an Indian as defined by the Indian Act. So for Mira, it's not going to lead to non-Indians or non-members acquiring permanent interests in reserve lands either. It is, um, you still have to be a member of the First Nation in order for you to hold a permanent interest, okay? The other important thing to, uh, to recognize as well is that anyone who's looking for remedies under Fermira, so if you have um, an, a, a breakdown of a relationship and a, a spouse is, um, the spouses are unable to come to an agreement and one of them makes an application to the court, they are obligated to provide a copy of the application to the First Nation, okay? If you're looking for remedies under the legislation, you must notify council. The provisional federal rules can't be applied retroactively. So that's why it's really, really important for you to understand and to really be sure you know what rules apply when, okay? They only apply in situations where the relationship broke down or the death of the spouse occurred on or after December the 16th, 2014, or if you were one of those um, signatories that was on this the, the schedule on the date of royal assent, then June the 19th of 2016, okay? Know which coming into force date applies. It's really, really uh, critical. So let's get into some of these provisional federal rules. Uh, as I said a little earlier, they're covered in sections 12 to 52 of the legislation, and they provide this set of interim rules that allow spouses and married, uh, sorry, spouses and common law partners to determine uh, what they should be entitled to, what rights and remedies exist for them within the legislation, both on the breakdown of a relationship and on the death of a spouse. So as we go through these provisional federal rules over the next hour or so, um, if there is something that really just doesn't sit well with you or you think, you know, I'm, I'm not sure that that fits with, uh, with our tradition and culture, then what I would ask you to do, what I would challenge you to do is think about, okay, how could we make this right? How could we improve this uh, through the development of our own law? So I'm going to go um, through the provisional federal rules somewhat numerically. So I'm going to start with section 13. And what section 13 does is it confirms the right of each spouse or common law partner to occupy that family home during the conjugal relationship, whether or not that person is a First Nation member or an Indian. This is an important section for those of you who uh, have uh, potentially got um, residency bylaws, as an example, you might want to take a look at your residency bylaw and make sure the provisions in that legislation are consistent with the rights and protections that exist um, in the federal legislation. And, and frankly, that's probably something that may be required in terms of all of your policies. This legislation really uh, provides rights and protections to spouses and common law partners that are still you know relatively new and potentially unfamiliar so it may be a good idea to take a look at all of your policies and bylaws and take a look at whether or not they're consistent with uh, with the legislation section 14 is a really important one and and surprisingly it's one that i hear about um, quite often sadly and what section 14 does is it provides a spouse or common law partner who is a survivor so their spouse or common law partner has died it allows that survivor the automatic ability to remain in that home for a minimum of 180 days and the idea behind that 180 days is to allow someone 
to, to, to breathe, to grieve, uh, and to really take some time to think about how, what their life is going to look like in the absence of their life partner. So it's really just an opportunity to, to figure out what their next steps will be. And that is an automatic 180 days. There's no requirement to apply for that. The legislation provides it automatically. And uh, for those of you who are technicians um, within the community, this is something that you really want to be aware of. And it may be something that you want to, to share with the members of your community, um, specifically so that uh, people don't trample on other people's rights inadvertently. Um, I have had a number of calls uh, from survivors who have been uh, locked out of their homes. Um, I've I really most recently, um, and I keep thinking that, you know, we're, we're almost six years in now that potentially people have got a better understanding of the, the protections under the legislation. But it really was just a number of months ago that I received a call from a woman who, um, whose spouse had passed and she went to purchase, um, she went to purchase food for the wake and came back to find all of her locks had changed. Um, someone had come in and, and changed her locks. And in that instance, um, she hadn't intended, she didn't intend to stay anyway. What she, what she had always planned was that she would return to her own First Nation, which was nearby. She would return to her own First Nation, to her family, um, and have her um, have her family care for her in her grief, and she didn't intend to stay. But because of, you know, the hasty decisions, um, there were some, some feelings hurt and some bridges burnt that, um, that might not have been had people kind of taken a second to, to understand and to have a conversation about what rights and protections exist for survivors. And, uh, and take some time to move forward in, in, um, in understanding those. Section 15 um, is a requirement for consent. So that means that a, uh, a spouse or a common law partner that is trying to transfer or encumber um, the family home must obtain the consent of his or her uh, spouse or common law partner. So if you're wishing to register an instrument um, in ILRS, as an example, Indian Land Registration System, you have to obtain the consent of your spouse or common law partner, whether or not that person is a member or an Indian, where the family home is affected. So some of you may have seen uh, these forms or, or some, something similar. So these are just examples of the forms that are required when you are registering an ILRS. So the assessment of matrimonial real property and statutory declaration, which is the, um, the form that's on the left-hand side, that form determines whether or not the family home is being affected by the transaction. So if um, in completing this statutory declaration, the proponent says that yes, the family home is in fact located on the subject land, then that triggers a requirement for the statutory declaration of the spouse or common law partner, which is the form that you see on the right hand side of the um, of the page. Uh, I, I guess I'm going to add at this point in time too that if you are registering in the First Nation land range, First Nation land and FNLRS, um, the, the, uh, the First Nation, there are different forms for registering in that system. This is for people who are managing under the Indian Act, First Nations that are managing under the Indian Act and registering in ILRS. Um, if you have questions about what those forms look like, uh, again, your regional advisor is the best person to, um, to do that, to, to help you find those forms. So you, um, and, and really, those are for signatories who continue to be subject to the provisional federal rules. Okay. Kathy, just going back to section 13 for a moment. Yes. Is that 180 days uh, working days or just days completely? It's like just days. It's 180 days from the date of the death of the spouse. 
Thank you. Okay, that's section 14, too sharp. Thanks. Um, here, uh, there's a link. This is um, this is a little video that we have on our website. You can find it. Um, I'm hoping when the PDF version of this comes out, there'll be a live link actually to uh, to this video. If it isn't live, it's on our website, coemrp.ca, under the resources tab, and it's um, resources for First Nation leadership and technicians. And this just basically explains the forms, explains the need for the forms, and helps to walk you through what check boxes go where. So that is a a handy little um, piece of information. Oops, that's not what I want to do. I want to go. Can you advance the slide, Char? No, I don't have. Oh. You see, whenever when I try to advance it, it um, it starts. Oh, here we go. Okay. I just needed to, I just needed to let it start. I guess. Uh, section sixteen to nineteen are the next um, provisions I want to talk about. They are relating to emergency protection orders. So, what the legislation actually does is it provides for emergency protection orders in cases of family violence, and the idea is to ensure that the immediate protection of a person who's either at risk of harm or a property that's uh, at risk of damage. So those are emergency protection orders. But unfortunately, um, Formira includes a provision that requires the Lieutenant Governor and Council of the province to designate a judge for the purpose of section 16 to 19 of the act. So what in that, an example of that might be, um, you know, a Sunday afternoon, there's um, a, a difficult situation on the First Nation and there is a, um, family violence that results and there's a, a need to provide immediate protection. Um, if the province had designated a judge as an example, potentially a justice of the peace who was available on that date, uh, at that time, you know, it's a Sunday afternoon, you're not probably going to find a, a, um, a, a judge uh, during that time. So a, a designated judge could in fact make an emergency protection order that would take effect immediately and provide, if, and provide immediate protection and immediate right to reside, to remain in that family home. But most provinces have chosen not to designate judges. So we have uh, New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, uh, PEI, Newfoundland, really the Atlantic provinces um, are where you can find designated judges. For most of us, there are, there's no designation. So without a designated judge, an emergency protection order under, under section 16 isn't currently available in all provinces. So it's important, um, I, I recognize this is a national event and I potentially have people from every province in Canada. It is just important for you to know uh, whether or not there are designated judges in your uh, province and whether or not the opportunity for an emergency protection order exists. So, even without emergency protection orders, there are other kind of no contact orders and conditions that could be ordered um, in criminal situations. But what's important about emergency protection orders is that they apply directly to the occupation and use of a family home on a First Nation reserve. So what an emergency protection order would allow if, if the province uh, had designated judges and we were able to, to actually access those, is the immediate legal right to remain in that family home. Okay, so without, de without designated judges, uh, that is, that's not available. But there is an option. So in the absence of an emergency protection order, a victim of family violence could, could still proceed with an application for exclusive occupation under section 20. So section 20 is the next section we're going to talk about, but I just wanted to bring it up here and let you know that um, it is an option. And under section 20 sub two, 
there's an opportunity for a judge to issue an interim order, which would um, which would take effect pending a, a full hearing of the case, right? Of pending the determination of the application. So that is an option um, where emergency protection orders don't exist. So these exclusive occupation orders that I just quickly referenced, they're covered in sections 20 and 21 of the legislation. And it provides for an applicant to be granted an order for temporary exclusive occupation of the family home. So if you uh, can't resolve uh, your matters as a couple or as a family, um, and you choose to, to make an application to the court, then if the situation is occurring as a result of a separation, then section 20 would be the section that you would be making application under. Um, if you were uh, applying because your spouse or common law partner has died and you are unable to come to an agreement around occupancy um, with your family, then you would be looking at making an application under section 21 of the legislation. So what this exclusive occupation order can do is that it's going to allow a court to issue uh, short to longer term occupancy of the family home to the exclusion of the other spouse or common law partner. So it could be for a very short period of time. Maybe we're separating and I want to return to my own First Nation, but I need some time. I need to get my kids into a school. I need to find a place to live. Um, I need to make arrangements for my work. So maybe my application for exclusive occupation might be for six months or maybe even a year. You know, my, the kids have just started this um, school in September. I need to have until next September in order to make arrangements to, to, for us to all move. So that might be a shorter term. But it might also be, if we're talking about exclusive occupation on the death of a spouse, this might be someone who has been part of your, your community for many, many years, um, and they're looking for exclusive occupation of the family home until such time as they can't anymore. So they may be looking to remain in the family home for a much longer time until they pass, as an example. So a set number of days to a much longer period, maybe till the dependent children reach the age of majority. There are a number of circumstances um, that would determine the, the, the length of time that an order um, might be granted for. These are some of the things that uh, the, the judge who's hearing this is going to consider in determining um, whether or not to grant an order. So they're going to look at the collective interests of the First Nation members. So that's, what does the council have to say about this? What does the council think is appropriate in, in this circumstance? What are the best interests of the children in this, in this family home? And it may not necessarily be children of the relationship, certainly those are going to be considered, but it's just generally children within this family home. You might be, um, you might be a foster parent, so there may be children that you are raising as, as foster children. Uh, potentially your nephew was having a, a difficult time in, in his situation and he's moved in with you and you're, you know, you're, you're demonstrating your intent to parent this child. So it's the best interest of any of the children who are residing in that home. The judge will also consider the terms of any agreements. If you had an agreement, uh, a, a cohabitation agreement, a marriage contract with your spouse or um, that already determined how these matters would be treated, the judge would consider that in, in his, making his or her determination. The other question is the period of time that the applicant has habitually resided on the reserve. Uh, the financial situation or the medical condition, it may be that this family home is the only home in the village that um, that is accessible. So one of the uh, one of the spouses or common law partners may require that ramp or those wider doorways or that uh, you know that more accessible bath bathroom. Um, the question of other suitable accommodations is another one, uh, but always family violence. Family violence is always going to be um, one of the top considerations that a justice is going to, to, to look at, that the courts will look at, um, really with the intent of making sure that everyone um, is safe. 
Uh, so if we look at this exclusive occupation graphic, so there's our little house and our, our two people who are separating, and they, um, they can always come to an agreement together or through mediation around what's going to happen to that house, who's going to remain in that house, whether there's going to be some compensation paid from one to the other, they can come to an agreement together or through mediation. Now, the only caveat to that is if this is a band house, clearly the band needs to be involved. Okay, so if if this is a band rental or a band home where they are occupying that uh, that house at the pleasure of the band, clearly the First Nation needs to be involved in that discussion. Now, if they can't come to an agreement, then either spouse could apply to the court for exclusive occupation. And someone always says, can they both apply? Well, generally the first one is the applicant and the other person is the respondent in those kinds of situations. So um, when, uh, I mentioned a little earlier, when someone is looking for remedies under the legislation, they're obligated to provide notice to the council and they must also provide notice to the other parties. Now, generally the other party is your spouse. You're asking that your spouse be removed, but there may in some cases be other individuals that you're asking to be excluded from the house as well. Maybe, um, maybe someone who, who lives there, you know, a brother or an aunt or an uncle who's also uh, living in the home, but creates um, um, a challenge uh, should they remain in the family home. So if that were the circumstance, then, then they would be served as well. They would be provided notice as well. So when the council gets, uh, receives notice, then they need to do some thinking and determine what their position is. And everybody then gets an opportunity to let the court know what they think. So the council is going to determine its position and say to the court, we support the application or we oppose the application. And these are the reasons why. Uh, and similarly, the, um, the other parties have that opportunity as well. So the court's going to hear everyone's position. They're going to synthesize all of that information and they're going to issue an order. Once an order is made, it's the responsibility of the applicant who, successful, who successfully um, receives the order, is granted the order, they must notify the Minister of Indigenous Services Canada by providing a copy of that order, and they must also provide a copy of that order to the First Nation. Okay, so the First Nation always knows who has a um, legal right to reside on the reserve. If we're talking about exclusive occupation on the death of a spouse or a common law partner, what do they always have first? The automatic 180 days, right? So it's very similar circumstances, but there's always the automatic 180 days. The other thing I want to say about the 180 days is sometimes people get confused and they think the 180 days applies everywhere. It doesn't. It only applies on the death of a spouse or common law partner, okay? So again, the family might resolve it amongst themselves, the, the, the kids or the stepkids or the brother-in-law who's um, receiving this property, um, they, can, they can resolve it amongst themselves and determine, you just keep living there, it's all good, you pay the hydro, you keep the property in a good state of repair, um, you know, what, whatever arrangements that, uh, that the family might want to do. Again, though, if this is a band owned home, a rent to own agreement, um, um, a rental unit, a, a section 10, a section 95, any of those kinds of um, circumstances are going to require that the First Nation be involved in the decision making. So again, if that family can't resolve it amongst themselves, same process exists. They, the, um, the survivor could apply for exclusive occupation or potentially a division of value if that's uh, what they're looking for. Um, but always they've got to notify the other parties. And because this is an estate situation now, we have the death of a spouse involved, then there are potentially a number of heirs um, or beneficiaries that need to also be um, provided with notice of whatever application might be being made. Again, the notice to council, council is going to think about this and determine its position, and everybody's going to talk to the courts about what they believe uh, the outcome should be. 
then the court will again synthesize this. I just want to maybe um, this is a good time to interject and just say that I, I, I the council, the legislation doesn't provide a council to veto an application. So the council's position when the council makes representation to the court, it is one of the things that the that the judge will uh, that the courts will consider in making their decision, but it's not a veto. So just so we're clear about that. Again, once the court synthesizes all of that information and makes their order, then the successful applicant is obligated to make um, a, a, to provide a copy of the the order to the Minister of Indigenous Services Canada and to the First Nation. Um, Section 28 to 31, I'm just wondering if this is, um, Char, I think before I start this one, maybe this is a good time for us to break. We're about three minutes early, but does sure. that work? We do have a hand raised. Oh, okay, let's answer that question first. I'm just going to unmute. Um, oh, I'll just go ahead and then, let's see. I was just going back to the 180 days on the next screen there. Yes. That she was talking about. Um, yes. Is that prior to like anybody or is that to like non BEM members that if your spouse was to pass, is that like 180 days for the non BEM member to make a decision of like, or is it for the council to make a decision on? What happens with the home? That 180 days is an automatic right for that survivor to remain in their family home and make decisions about what their next steps are going to be. So it may be that if they want to remain in that family home past the 180 days, then they would be looking to make an application for exclusive occupation under Section 21. And that really is for um it's not it's not just for non-member spouses uh it could be it could be non-interest holding spouses and i'm just going to take a second to to explain what that is so in our first nation for many many years after uh certificates of possession began to be issued they were issued to men so so even though my mom was a member of our First Nation, the certificate of possession that our family home was, was on was actually only held by my father. So prior to the, the family homes legislation coming into play, um, she would have been a, a non-interest holding spouse. So she would have been in the same situation as a non-member spouse. And that if my dad, as an example, had left the family home to his brother or his uncle or his oldest child, then my mom wouldn't have had any legal recourse because she was a non-interest holding spouse. So now a survivor has that 180 days to determine what is best for them. Do I want to continue to live in this house? Can I sort it out with my family and continue on without um, a court application? Or do I need to make a court application either to remain in my home for whatever period of time I wish, or maybe I've decided that the house is too big and the lawn is too big and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not inclined to cut the grass and shovel the driveway anymore. So maybe they want to move into a, um, one of those cute little uh, retirement home, uh, retirement units that the band might have in operation. So maybe instead they're going to say, mm, no, uh, but I, I'm going to apply for division instead. So I want my, um, I want to be compensated for my half of the value of this property so that I can now move in and, and start my life in a different way. So that's what the 180 days is for. It's really, it's not a lot of time. I think I'd still be on the floor in fetal position if, you know, if I lost my husband, but you have 180 days to make some pretty significant decisions about the rest of your life as a, as a person and um, after having lost your, your life partner. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions before we take a quick break, Shar? 
Nope, nothing in the chat. Okay, so how long are we breaking? So how about we, um, how about we, we come back at five two? Okay, so, so that's like not quite 10 minutes. So okay, it gives sure. everyone a chance to grab a drink and have a quick washing break because I, I really have a fair amount left to go through. Okay, absolutely. We'll Perfect. see you at five to the hour then everyone. Yeah, I think go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay, perfect. So um, just moving on, then we're going to talk now about sections 28 to 31. And these are complicated provisions that deal with a division of value of matrimonial interests or rights. And again, the caveat here is that if the family home is a rental unit that's owned by the band or you're occupying um, the, the property at the pleasure of the band or, in fact, of, of someone else, then division may not be applicable in these circumstances, right? You can't have half of something you don't own. But the occupancy options that exist within the legislation would continue to be available. Whoops. So the, um, the, the purpose of these sections is really to make sure that the proven value of the, the, the matrimonial interests or rights in or to the family home and any other structures that are on reserve are shared fairly. They can't be shared equally, as I said earlier, given the, um, the nature of reserve land, but shared fairly on the breakdown of a relationship. Um, so if both spouses are members, then the value of the interest or rights to land can also be considered for the purposes of division. And that's section 28. So in order to really understand division, you need to wrap your head around the types of interests that exist in your community. So spouses and common law partners could hold land in a variety of ways. They may have certificates of possession. They may have certificates of occupation. Uh, potentially there's lease agreements. Uh, it might be an interest that's been granted under a First Nation land code, uh, or it could be a custom allotment, and custom allotments aren't recognized as legal land holdings in the, um, under the Indian Act. Houses too, uh, you know, a, a family home may have been built using an individual's own funds. It might be a band guaranteed loan. It might be some sort of rent to own agreement. So understanding the interest to right that's been granted by the First Nation will assist individuals in understanding what the potential is for division. So if we look at this graphic, then this is a formal land holding. So it's a certificate of possession with a $100,000 house on it. And the value of the land in this instance is $20,000. So always, always, there's nothing in this legislation require, that requires court. It recognizes the rights and the ability of a couple to resolve these matters amongst themselves without having to access the courts. But everything that we're talking about in terms of the provisional federal rules is that worst case scenario where you can't resolve it as a family. So if they were able to come to, to an agreement either together through some sort of mediation, uh, potentially the First Nation has a dispute resolution process that's accessible to the couple, that would be ideal. Uh, I don't think I'm speaking out of turn to suggest that the courts aren't always familiar with our approach to land, our connection to the land. Um, so wherever possible, be resolving it outside of the courts, I think has the potential to be a better resolution, but sometimes we can't get there. When someone's angry or someone's hurt, it's difficult to get there. So if someone um, has no choice but to apply to the courts, exactly the same situation, right? Someone's going to apply for a division of value. They're going to have to tell their spouse or common law partner. They're going to have to provide a copy of that application to the council. The council is going to have to formulate its position about whether or not to support the application or not. Um, and then everyone talks to the court again. So the, 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 the court is made aware of the feelings of the spouse as well as the feelings of the council. Now, a good example of how the council might get involved in this situation is, so we have our house and our land that's valued at $120,000 combined, but 
what if there is a mortgage? What if they've, uh, what if the band has loaned them some money to build or purchase this house and there's an outstanding mortgage? So if someone's making an application for half the value, so we're talking $60,000, it's at this point that the council would be able to step in and say, hang on, there's an outstanding mortgage of $80,000 uh, on this property, then the amount uh, available for division is the value of the property less than he debts for acquiring it. So it's 120 less 80 is what, 40? I don't know, my math isn't the greatest. So that means that the application then would be for half the eight, half of the 40. So someone would be looking for compensation for $20,000. So again, the council and others make representation to the court. The court determines what it considers to be fair, issues the order, and the successful applicant then has to provide that copy to the minister uh, and to the First Nation. So here we are, that very same property, $120,000. Now this is, remember I said we divide it fairly and not necessarily equitably. Well, if it's a member and a member, then they can share half the value of the family home. So there's the 50,000. They can also share half the value of the land if this is a formal land holding. So the possible division in that scenario is $60,000. But if it's a member and a non-member, then really it's just the structure that's divisible. So half the value of the family home is what's available for division. A non-member can't share in the value of the land. The land is here for the use and benefit of the members. So a non-member would not be able to make application for um, half the value of the land. Where are we? So here we're back to looking at our other matrimonial interests or rights. And I'm going back to the same um, graphic because we're, Individuals have multiple land holdings. The, the value of the family home is generally divisible, unless there's a legally binding domestic agreement that was made between the partners. So, so the family home, um, a presumptive equal share, so 50% of the family home. But the division of all of the other matrimonial interests or rights is much more complicated. And it depends on a number of factors. As an example, when it was acquired, if it's appreciated in value so you brought that piece of property to the relationship um, and it has increased in value over the course of your relationship the amount that's divisible is the amount that it's grown so if it was worth fifty thousand dollars when you uh when you when you came together as a couple you're now separating and it's worth sixty thousand dollars then it's the growth that's um it's the appreciation and value that's divisible if it was received as a gift or an inheritance, it is exempt. It does not count as matrimonial real property. Now, that being said, you want to be, um, you want to make sure that you appreciate that the family home is divisible. So if, as an example, you inherited um, a, a home and you moved into that home together as a couple, it's where you habitually reside as a couple, right? So it's potentially divisible. So important things to consider um, in, in those kinds of circumstances. Again, the amount available to share is the value of the property less any debts against it. So if there is a mortgage, then clearly it's the value less whatever is outstanding that becomes uh, the amount that you can share. Section 28 allows for a court to make an order to enforce a free and informed written agreement. So if the spouses and common law partners can come together uh, and make an agreement that is not unconscionable, unconscionable meaning mm, grossly unfair, I guess is the best way I could describe it, that sets out the amount to which each is entitled and how to settle that amount. So if you can come to an agreement around how those kinds of um, real property matters will be settled, the judge will consider that in hearing um, and in making his decision. That's section 28.5. And I just want to mention um, that, the, that we just actually contracted with a lawyer who has put together um, a booklet with, uh, I think it's three sample um, domestic agreements. Uh, that is, that will be on our website in the next little while. So 
keep an eye out for that if that's something that you're you're uh, inclined to need. Um, again, not legal advice, but just some samples that might get you thinking about the sorts of things you would need to consider uh, when you're having your legal counsel draft something for you. Section 34, we start to talk about um, division on the death of a spouse. So section 34, that allows a survivor to make an application under the provisional federal rules for half the value of the matrimonial real property interests as an alternative to inheriting from the estate. So if there's a will, it's an alternative to the will. If there is no will and the intestacy provisions of the Indian Act apply, then, then the survivor has the opportunity to make application under Section 34 of the Provisional Federal Rules for a different distribution. So let's look at this, um, this graphic. So there's our family home. The member dies with a will and he's left the house to his oldest child. And we don't know why he did that. Um, maybe his, mem maybe his uh, partner was a member from another First Nation or a member from a nearby town and could not inherit the property, could not have a formal interest, a permanent interest in the property. It could be that the member had a will from a while back and has now repartnered and has a new relationship and um, they, they, uh, he now has a survivor. Um, so he dies with his will and he's left his house to his oldest child. Again, the family can resolve the survivor's rights and the occupancy of that family home amongst themselves. They can come together as a family and determine uh, those kinds of things potentially always with the involvement of the band. Remember, if we've got, if the, the band um, has an interest as well in terms of uh, it potentially being a rental or a rent to own agreement or a mortgage or whatever um, that might be. So they can resolve that amongst themselves, but if they can't, then the survivor always has options. The survivor could apply for exclusive occupation for whatever period, you know, it may be, they already have their 180 days. So in that 180 days, they're going to determine do I really want to remain here? Do I want to move uh, closer to my children who, you know, maybe live in the city? Um, do I want to consider moving into the elders complex where I can get occasional support, but still live in my own little more manageable apartment? So they might also apply for division if that's applicable. So if they have a, a, a more formal interest, um, it's, it's a potential that they might apply for a division in that instance. So none of those, the application for exclusive occupation or the application for division would um, prevent the transfer of the house to the heir. So the oldest child, the property could still be transferred to the oldest child. However, remember the consent obligations. So if an exclusive occupation order was granted, then the heir's use and enjoyment of the property is going to be delayed until the order expires. So if the survivor receives um, an exclusive occupation order for five years, they can still transfer the property to the heir or the, the beneficiary, pardon me. But he couldn't, he or she couldn't use the property until that order for exclusive occupation expires. Okay. Um, and the other uh, little bit worrisome thing is if there's an order for division, that might become a debt against the estate that would require the attention of the executor, right? So if the, if the survivor says, I'm not, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I need to find a smaller place, so I'm going to make an application for division for half the value of the family home, then that becomes a debt against the estate. And the question there, the complicating question is, where does the money come from to compensate that surviving spouse? Okay, sometimes in a worst case scenario, that might actually involve liquidating some of the assets. And if the only asset of the estate is the family home, um, then there's always, unfortunately, the potential for a sale in that situation. You'll note in the little orange box, I've got a must read. Tony versus Tony Estate is the case study I'm actually going to be talking about in the next little while. But it's an interesting read. If you get a chance, uh, you probably should take a look at it. It's quite interesting uh, to see how the, the legislation was applied. The role of chief and counsel under the provisional federal rules. We all know that the values and the practices 
amongst our 630 some odd First Nations in this country very greatly. What you do in your community is not necessarily the way we do things in our First Nation uh, or, in, or, or in any of the, um, the First Nations in the province. So the legislation recognizes this range of values that exist and the Act provides for First Nations to be notified in, in regard to any proceedings under this Act. So under Section 41, there is, as we said, a requirement to notify the Council so that the Council can exercise its duties to protect the collective interest, um, except in cases of emergency protection orders. So that's Section 16 to 19. Remember where, the, um, where we don't have designated judges, but in some provinces we do. Um, so, as I said, it's in, contained in Section 41, and what that says is that an applicant for an order under this Act, except 16 and 19, must without delay send a copy to the Council of any First Nation on whose reserve the structures and lands in question are situated. Okay, so if I'm making an application um, for exclusive occupation or for division, I am obligated to provide a copy of that application to the Council. And the council then has the opportunity to provide um, uh, representation to the court. I just want to clarify in, in that instance, um, it's, it's required that the council indicate their intent to make representation. So the judge has to allow the council to make representation, but it's important that you let the, uh, the courts know that you intend to. So my suggestion is that if you are ever faced with an application under this legislation that preemptively actually, uh, in advance of that, you might want to craft a, um, a template letter that, that, that you're going to automatically return to the courts and say, yes, we intend to exercise our rights to make representation to the courts. These kinds of things tend to be quite um, time sensitive. So you could you you know you want to get your foot in the door and say yes we intend to make representation if after you've had a chance to review all of the information and um and you feel that you know both parties are good people um the first nation doesn't have any concerns around which of the two of them continue to remain in the home uh, you might then say we're happy with the court making making the decision but always I think it's probably a good practice to always make representation. The, the flip side of not doing that is I worry about a situation where the court makes a decision that's unpopular. At least as technicians and as leaders within the, within the First Nation, if you have made representation to the court, then, then you can speak to your community about that and say, we we advanced our position the judge felt otherwise but if you inadvertently miss a deadline and don't make representation to the courts or you choose not to um i think you need to as a first nation balance that risk and determine whether you feel it's important to make representation in every situation um section 41 2 so again on the council's request the court that receives the application must, before making its decision, allow the council to make representation. Now, that little uh, picture in the corner there, I've just added, um, it's our implementation of the matrimonial real property regime toolkit. And in that toolkit, which we've really just finished in the last couple of weeks, and it's, uh, it's going to be translated shortly into French, there are a number of really handy tools. There's a template implementation plan, there's a Gantt chart, there's uh, a list of planning questions, we have committee terms of reference, we have um, implementation committee status reports for council, uh, policies and procedures, content um, policy structures, there are a number of really good tools in that uh, in that toolkit that might help you, regardless of the regime you find yourself under. If you're under the provisional federal rules, this can help. If you've enacted your own matrimonial real property law, you can still take the templates and craft them so that they reflect the provisions of your own legislation. So when we're talking about the enactment of a First Nation law under FEMIRA, then these go back to those lawmaking provisions we talked about in the first few slides. 
So effective December 16th, 2013, a First Nation enacting under Fermira has the power to enact their law related to use, occupation, and possession of the family home and a division of the value of any interests or rights held by spouses. Okay, so those are the things that you can make laws about. Um, I had a First Nation who was concerned about the best interests of children, and they were thinking that they were going to include some provisions in that regard. So remember what the Constitution says about who has authority over what issues. So um, if you're enacting a matrimonial real property law, these are the areas that can be covered under that law. Use, occupation, possession, division. Uh, the act is not prescriptive, so laws can be designed to respect the First Nations particular needs, values, and customs. As an example, if every, if every home and every piece of land in the First Nation was owned by the band, and the, the people who were occupying those homes did so at the pleasure of the band, and there was no um, confusion about the ownership of that property, you might not ever have to include division in your in your law because the band owns all the land and all of the houses that's something to to consider however if you chose not to deal with division then that leaves out that individual who has um uh has had some good fortune and has had the ability to build their own home uh on a on a piece of property so what's important to understand is that once you enact your own law all of the provisional federal rules are gone okay so if you chose not to include one of the provisions that are contained in the legislation you are absolutely um, uh, able to do that uh, the thing i would caution is that you do a good risk analysis and think about but could there ever maybe be a situation where this would apply where we would need this. So consider that in, as, you, as you think about um, how you might want to craft your law. But don't get so hung up on it because there's always the, um, the opportunity to amend your law. There's a requirement that you have amending protocols in your, in your legislation. So you do the very best you can in crafting your law. And then if you have to change it, there's an option to do that. So this is important. The content and acceptability of any law is determined between the First Nation government and its members. So the, the law that you enact is between your government, your band council, and the, the membership in your First Nation. So INAC's not going to look at it and disallow it. They're not going to change it. They're not going to cancel it. Neither the minister or any other government official can do that. Um, but enactment of a First Nation law requires community approval. If we just go back to that previous slide, if you are ever challenged, it's going to be probably from someone to whom the legislation applies, right? So it's going to be a member of your community or the spouse of a member of your community, someone to whom the legislation applies. It's not likely going to be anyone um, outside of the community that challenges your law, not likely. So when you enact the First Nation law, you, you require community approval, as we, as we said a little earlier. Every member of the First Nation who is 18 years and, of age and over, either a resident or not on the First Nation, is eligible to vote in the approval process. So you really have to do some work to take measures to locate voters, inform them of their rights, um, how they can exercise that right, and the content of the proposed law. Now, when we say 25% of your electors have to participate, that sounds like a low number, but my experience has been that it is a challenge to meet that. So um, when you proceed with lawmaking and you start thinking about ratification, um, don't underestimate how difficult it can be to get 25% of your electorate to participate in, in a vote. You're going to have to be creative and really reach out to all of your members to encourage their participation in this process. So as I said, the law would be approved and added to the INAC list if at least 25% of the eligible voters participated in the vote and a majority of those electors voted in favor, voted to approve it. 
Okay. You can enact your community specific law at any time as it comes to, you know, clearly we're in the middle of a pandemic. That is our priority right now. But um, the so when it becomes a priority for you, things settle down and you think maybe now is the time to move forward with the development, you can do that. Knowing, however, that the provisional federal rules are in effect now and they'll apply until you enact your own law. So again, if you are enacting under your land code, you're going to follow the provisions for lawmaking that are contained in your land code. And I just want to point out that there um, that previous to December 2018, uh, 5.4 of the framework agreement required that a First Nation operating um, develop those rules within within one year. Remember, we talked about that a little bit earlier. Um, but it was amended. The framework agreement was amended in 2018. So it provides now a, a full range of matrimonial real property authority. So there's a new provision to expand. So on the, uh, the current authority. So if you're enacting under your land code, you can now also include provisions uh, that would take effect on the death of a spouse. Um, the 12 month uh, period for a First Nation to make its own rules has been eliminated since the provisional federal rules will, will apply in the meanwhile. There's also a new provision that requires that uh, provinces or territories uh, be notified when you're proposing to make an MRP law. Um, but as I said, questions regarding the amendments really should be directed to your regional lab RC advisor. If you're, if you're a signatory, they are your best asset. We've also got some funding available through the NALMA. I'm having a hard time transitioning to say NALMA instead of COEMRP. Um, so if your First Nation decides to proceed with enacting its own MRP law, if you want to raise awareness of the provisions of FERMIRA, if you need to build some operational capacity to support implementation, as an example, you, if someone makes an application, you will be notified. So you're going to have copies of applications. If they are successful, you will have copies of orders. So you are going to be um, uh, receiving very private, personal, uh, sensitive information. Maybe in terms of building operational capacity, you need to take a look at your confidentiality policy, your document management strategies, um, your conflict of interest policies. So there, there may be um, some operational capacity that needs to be improved upon, and we can support some of those activities. So you might be of, um, eligible for funding under a variety of categories. Um, this is a bit of a flow chart. So I, um, the orange boxes right off the bat, uh, those funding categories are available for any First Nation who's currently under the provisional federal rules. Okay, anything in the green is um, uh, are others as well that are available to any any First Nation that is not a signatory. So, um, and the remaining blue categories those are also available to any First Nation that's enacting under Fermira. So it's a little bit of a complicated uh, chart. But if you work through um, this, the situations, uh, you should be able to answer your own questions. If you uh, have questions, there's my contact information and my direct line and my email address. You're welcome to call me and we can uh, discuss whether um, a funding um, application is something you, you should really entertain. So let's before we move into this case study, let's review the survivor rights under Fermira. So when a spouse or common law partner dies, that survivor who doesn't hold an interest to right in the family home gets to stay in that home for a period of 180 days after the day on which the death occurred, right? Whether or not that survivor is a First Nation member or an Indian, that's the automatic 180 days that's covered in section 14. A court on application by survivor, whether or not that person is a First Nation member, can order that the survivor be granted exclusive occupation of the family home, 21-1. So first we had the automatic 180 days. Now we can extend occupation uh, under section 21 if you are granted an exclusive occupation order. Um, 
again, rem remembering that the court can make an interim order to the same effect pending the full determination of the, the, the hearing. Under the provisional federal rules, a survivor has a choice to make, right? You can either benefit from a court ordered division of the value of the deceased interest in or right to a family home and other matrimonial interests or rights under the provisional federal rules. So you could make a court application under section 34 of Fermira. Option two is that you inherit from the deceased will or under the intestate estate provisions of the Indian Act Okay, so you could you could choose to just follow what was um, identified in the will, or you could follow the intestacy provisions contained in section 48. Now, in both of these cases, each is specific to the family home or other matrimonial interests or rights. It doesn't mean that the, it doesn't preclude the survivor from inheriting other assets from the deceased. So an application under section 34 is all about the family home and other matrimonial interests or rights. So if the survivor chooses option one, which is to make an application under section 34, they have to do that within 10 months of the date of death. Okay, so there's quite a, there's a very specific um, timeframe within which that application can be made. Uh, so section 34 sets out survivor entitlements respecting the family home and the matrimonial interests or rights. Now the courts could extend the 10 month period in certain circumstances. So if the death was a result of an accident, as an example, and both spouses were injured, it may be that the, um, the surviving spouse was not well enough to make an application within the 10 month period. So the courts could consider uh, extending that period of time. If the survivor decides to take option two and chooses to inherit under the deceased's will, the estate can't be distributed until one of the following occurs. So the survivor has to consent. There's a requirement, uh, just like when you're trying to transfer uh, a property, um, the requirement for spousal consent. Well, there's a requirement for the survivor to consent. So either the survivor consents in writing or the 10 month period passes and no application has been made or they do make an application, but somehow or another, the estate had the assets that they were able to satisfy the order that the court made. Um, if the survivor consents in writing though, if the, if the survivor consents in writing, you don't have to wait the 10 months for the distribution to occur because you've got the consent at that point. So Tony versus Tony estate is a 2018 case from the Nova Scotia Supreme Court. Um, the applicant was Marlene Tony, and she was the widow of an Annapolis Valley member, Lawrence Tony, and he passed away in July of 2016. She's not a member. She's not an Indian as defined by the Indian Act. Um, the, the specifics of the case were that the band provided some funds towards the construction of the home, and then the certificate of possession was issued quite a bit later in 1998. So Mr. Tony's first wife and, and three children, they lived in the house until they left. She left the reserve and the, the children went with her. Lawrence then married Marlene um, a number of years later, and they lived in that house together for more than 30 years. So now the, the, the house is the family home of Marlene and Lawrence. So Mrs. Tony was the band manager. Um, she uh, had some medical challenges but she continued to, to be active in the community. Um, when the, the case was finally heard, <clears throat> pardon me, Mrs. Tony required the assistance of a healthcare aide. So uh, she, um, her illness had progressed to the point where she did require a little bit of assistance and she really was of limited financial means. So, those were the facts, those were the, the circumstances that, um, that were presented to the court. Now, the issue became complicated because in his will, Mr. Tony named her not only his executor, his executrix, pardon me, but also his sole beneficiary. So Lawrence's estate was that matrimonial home that they, that they shared together, that was on lot one. He also had another little piece of property that he'd acquired um, uh, a number of years later. Uh, that was lot 15. So the certificate of possession 
for the lot on which the family home was situated was, um, was granted to him in 1998. And then in 2000, he purchased that second lot, that second uh, certificate of possession. So there were a number of improvements that were made to the house after the original investment by the band. So the band invested the original 23,000 many, many years ago in the 70s, as we said. Um, Mr. and Mrs. Uh, Tony made a number of improvements totaling somewhere around $140,000. So the, the challenge was that there was insurance on the property. So we're really kind of trying to get to what is the value of the matrimonial real property. So the insurance said somewhere around $400,000. Um, it was very difficult to obtain an appraisal, so no appraisal was actually obtained because there were only 250 members both on and off reserve. So it was very, very challenging in such a limited market to determine what the, the value might be. So again, the, the other complication being that Mr. Tony's will left his entire estate to his non-member wife, which is contrary to the Indian Act. So ISC determined, Indigenous Services Canada determined that it would be treated like an intestacy. So they were going to convey the certificate of possession and the family home that was located on top of it to all five of Mr. Tony's children. Okay, so all of the heirs were entitled to share in the value of the estate uh, under Section 48 of the Indian Act, which is the intestacy section. So um, the three children that he had with his first wife and the two children that the, the Tonys had together. So she was concerned that the property would be sold and she wouldn't have any place to live, that the property would be sold in order to satisfy um, the, the interests of all five of the children. So what she did was she chose instead to exercise her rights under Section 21 and Section 34. So under Section 21, she applied for an order for indefinite exclusive occupation of the family home. And she also applied for a division of the value of the matrimonial real property that was held by her late husband's estate. Okay, so here we are working through this case. So we've now got an application. She had her 180 days. She's now making an application for exclusive occupation, and she's making an application for a division of value. Pardon me. In accordance with section 41, right, that's the requirement to provide notice to the council. The First Nation chose to respond and they made representation to the court. So what they requested was that the exclusive occupation be limited to 12 months because of the, um, the housing shortages and the housing wait list that existed within their, their First Nation. And they also provided some information with regard to the valuation of that reserve land and what um, what that might be. So the Supreme Court of Nova Scotia issued its decision on July the 25th of 2018. So they, they considered all of those factors that are set out in 21.3, right? The, the best interests of any children, the uh, representation made by the First Nation, the health of the of the the applicant, the availability of other accommodations within the community. Um, so the 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 courts considered all of those factors, and the judge in his findings ordered indefinite exclusive occupation of the family home with some conditions. So he agreed that Mrs. Tony be be able to remain in the family home. But the interesting, um, the interesting condition was that the applicant not cohabitate with anyone other than her children or grandchildren, and that she maintain the home and not commit waste, which really is just another way of saying that she maintained the home in a good state of repair. So the, the, um, the, where the Section 34 application, which was the application for a division of value, the judge determined that one half of the value of the family home would be 
$70,000. So he determined that the most fair, reliable, and appropriate value was the $140,000 worth of improvements that they had made. So he awarded Mrs. Tony $70,000. So that was how um, there wasn't an opportunity to get a fair appraisal. It was very difficult to determine what the market value might be. So he really based his decisions on the improvements that were made to the home over the course of their relationship. So there was no um, there was no entitlement ordered for the second certificate of possession. So the lot 15 that he had purchased for the $3,000. <clears> and the reason why there was no division um, ordered for that was because we go back to that definition of matrimonial interests or rights, right? So if it's if, if different than the entitlement for the value of the family home, the entitlement was determined based on the provisions of section 34 too. So there was no appreciation and value over the course of the relationship, and there was no evidence of any improvements on the property. So the, the, um, the judge determined that no, um, no compensation would be, um, would be ordered for that other lot. So that is that, so that's just an, uh, an explanation of how the judge used the the legislation to come to his decision so it was very difficult in some circumstances to determine what the value of property is on reserve and really i think i might argue that that's a challenge um, really across the country uh, appraising first nation land given the limited market and the number of individuals who can actually purchase land there's also the um the complication of those situations where um, you have um, uh, custom allotments that aren't recognized as uh, lawful possession in some First Nations as well. So that was just a quick uh, overview of the the most uh, um, the most recent finding uh, of the courts in, in terms of their interpretation of the provisions of of Fermira. In this instance, it was a an estate situation. So you can see as you work through the slides how the determination was made. Um, I've just recently been advised of a um, of a case where it was on the separation. Um, it was the separation uh, of, I believe, the division of value in that instance that the court ordered was. Um, I'm guessing, I think it was somewhere around $78,000. I don't have it off the top of my head, but some of the concerns and the questions then become, where does that cash come from, right? Where does, in that instance, where does the estate um, come up with the $140,000 to compensate Mrs. Tony for her uh, interest in the family home and for the order that was granted by the courts? And then in this more recent situation, where does the individual who's um, been uh, ordered by the court to compensate their spouse, where does the cash come from? So there, there continues to be some, um, some issues with uh, accessing justice under the, under the legislation. And uh, I think it's going to be really interesting for us uh, to follow as the years go by and uh, more and more case law develops to see exactly how this situation um, how these various kinds of situations are interpreted by the court. So that was uh, that was um, information about the introduction to matrimonial real property. We did a very quick uh, case study on the Tony versus Tony uh, situation. This is the legal disclaimer that we had at the beginning and we're having again at the end. We don't provide legal advice. This information is based on what we know at the moment and the best information that we're able to um, to obtain through our uh, understanding of the legislation and the interpretation of the court. But things could change if an interpretation um, was different than what we what we believe um, the legislation uh, to mean. Again, we're always going to recommend that individuals obtain legal counsel. Uh, because that lawyer is going to be the one most um, most aware of and in tune with the Indian Act for Mira, the land code uh, on the First Nation that um, if that's applicable and and even more importantly, the couple specific circumstances. So 
Next steps. We're here for you. Uh, you have my contact information on this, um, on this PowerPoint. If you've got any questions after today, I'm really happy to speak with you. Uh, if your First Nation is thinking about enacting its own law, or you're, you feel like your, your council or your technicians could use a little bit uh, more information on what the legislation provides and how the provisional federal rules might apply in your circumstances, uh, call us. We're happy we can do Zoom sessions like this uh, to a specific uh, element, either your, your council or your council and your technicians. Um, if you find that you're getting questions from uh, people in your community that you are not 100% positive you can answer um, confidently, you're always welcome to share our contact information. Just let us know how we can help. We're here, we're happy to do whatever we can to, um, to help you to understand how this applies in your community and, uh, and call us, we're happy to hear. Um, there's our contact information for the Nama head office and my information is, uh, is included here as well. So that's it and it is good. We made good time. <laughs> we still have the half hour for questions. Um, Kathy, I do have a question going back a little bit um, okay. in your presentation. Uh -huh. um, could there be a situation where the children can buy the debt out without avoiding having to sell? Yeah, yeah, that's exactly. You could come up with an heirs agreement. So you could come up with an heirs agreement that's, that says, um, you know, we've decided that the property is going to be transferred to brother one or sister one. And he is going to compensate everybody in, in these amounts. So it is absolutely possible for, for, for a family to come up with an agreement that way. Does anyone have any other questions? You want to put them in the chat or I can unmute or you can unmute yourself and ask. Thank you, Stephanie, for putting those links to the toolkits in the chat for everyone. It's a, it's a very complicated topic. And sometimes you really need to kind of sit on it and mull over it and frame your, your question as well. So if you don't have one now, you all have my contact information. So um, I'm certainly happy to discuss it uh, with you one-on-one -on -one if that's what you feel more comfortable with. And just a reminder that the PowerPoint slides are available in the Whova app. So they will be available um, at the conclusion of the two days. Hi, this is Geraldine from Old Master Village Council and on Haida Gwaii. Um, I have a question about the, um, uh, where there's a survivor that is a non-member and they applied for what to go into, let's say uh, the assisted living or, or whatnot like that. So even, are they able to still do that even in BC? Uh, there's a part in there where it says they can apply for either, um, oh gosh. Exclusive okay. occupation. Yeah. Yeah. And Exclusive. then um, let's say they don't want, you said they don't want to maintain the home. So they apply for something else so they can go into assisted living or. Division. Uh, yeah. yeah. So they, they could, they could apply for division. And this again, is, and this, though. And this is for non-members as well, like non-Indigenous people? It could be non-Indigenous people okay. too, assuming that the survivor has a has an interest to write in the in the property, right? It's okay. It, you can't have half of something you don't own. So if yeah. you're living in banned housing, you wouldn't be applying for a division. Now you might you might actually be um, in a position to apply for division if the First Nation allowed improvements to be made on their on their structures. You mm -hmm. know, it might be a banned house, but we couldn't we couldn't wait for the band to fix the roof. So we together pooled our money and we fixed the roof on this house. And so mm -hmm. maybe between us, we'd be looking to, to share half the value of the $5,000 it costs to reshingle the roof. Okay. 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 
Perfect. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Um, another question, Kathy. Um, this individual, they have a, this First Nation has a member yes. that holds a house yes. with her brother. The okay. brother does not want anything to do with the house. Um, and the sister wants to sell. Do they need a signature from both to sell the house? If they are both on the certificate of possession, yes, they both have to sign. And if both of them have spouses or common law partners, it is also possible that they would need to get spousal consent if it's if one or the other of them is living in this property as the family home then spousal consent might be required at least if they're both on the certificate of possession they're going to have to complete the assessment so the assessment form would uh, determine whether the whether it's a family home that's being encumbered or transferred and if that were determined, then uh, spousal consent would be required. Thank you. Any other questions before we sign off? I don't see any, Kathy. Okay. Let me just scooch over here. Well, thanks. Thanks so much for the opportunity to, uh, to speak about this topic. Um, as I say, it's relatively new. It's very complicated. People are still trying to figure this out. Call if you have questions. We're happy to help. Thanks for your help, Char. Thanks, everyone, for attending. <laughs>